and on his credenza was a picture of himself and his wife being introduced to Queen Elizabeth. Now, you may say, well, that's really no big deal. It may not be, but it certainly proves this proverb to be accurate right up to date. And I happen to think it is a big deal. Earl Nightingale was diligent in his business. Hello, this is Bob Proctor, and we are on the last piece of the puzzle, progressive action activities. Remember we point out that success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal? Well, we want to make sure that all of our activities are progressive activities. Remember, I was on a speaking engagement with Earl Nightingale one time years ago, and we were in downtown Chicago, and he asked me if I wanted to meet him for breakfast prior to the engagement. Well, I certainly wouldn't pass up an opportunity like that. We were sitting in the hotel having breakfast, and I always admired how much he was able to do. He accomplished so much, and seemingly in such a short period of time. And so I asked him, I said, Earl, how did you master time management? And I remember him sort of chuckling and saying, I never mastered time management. He says, no one manages time. Time cannot be managed. He said, I merely manage activities. And you know something? My whole world shifted on that statement. If you're trying to manage time, I'd suggest you forget it. And I want to suggest you start paying attention to your activities and make sure that they're progressive, action-oriented activities. Look on the top of page 61. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe lived from 1749 to 1832. He is a titan in the literature and philosophy of Western civilization. He was a counselor to royalty, was sought out by Napoleon and Beethoven, and the great thinkers and artists of his age. He set in place, both by his example and his writings, the lust for achievement, which the whole of German civilization to this day is known for. Goethe was a phenomenal human being. He was diligent in his business, and he stood before kings. Now, the following is an excerpt from a letter that he wrote when he was 77 years of age, that was back in 1826, to his friend, Selpitz Borzeret. It is obvious that Goethe took great pleasure in learning, in creating, thinking, and doing. Goethe obviously knew how to put the pieces of his success puzzle in the proper place. I quote, Since God and his nature have left me to myself through so many years, I know nothing better to do than to express my grateful acknowledgement by youthful activity. Isn't that beautiful? I wish as long as it may be granted to me to show myself worthy of the good fortune which has been vouchsafed me. And I devote day and night to thinking and doing to the extent that it is possible and so that it may be possible. Day and night is no mere phrase. For a good many night hours, which I spend sleeplessly in keeping with the vicissitudes of my age, I devote not to vague and unspecific thoughts, but to precise consideration of what is to be done on the morrow, which I then begin faithfully in the morning and execute as far as possible. And so, perhaps, I accomplish more and, by planning, complete in the days allotted to me what one fails to do at a period when one has the right to believe or to fancy that there is still a tomorrow and always a tomorrow. I think what Gert is saying is don't put it off. Do it now. Throw yourself into your work. Like Earl said, not just your work and no more, but a little more for the lavishing sake. Give it everything you've got. Youthful activity. I never mastered time management. No one manages time. Time cannot be managed. I merely manage activities. In this last piece of the puzzle, I've included some information that I have put in a number of other programs because I think it's so important. You see, without the activity, none of the other pieces of the puzzle matters. We pointed out that the worthy ideal was vitally important, and it is. You could have the worthy ideal if you don't act on it. Nothing happens. We've got to walk the walk. 
I was listening to a gentleman, Larry Prophet, tell a story in Chicago, oh, here around three weeks ago. He talked about this elderly lady taking her son to Gandhi. She was having trouble getting the boy to do what she wanted him to do, and she figured if Gandhi could talk to him, Gandhi'd get him to do it. Finally, she got in an audience with him, and she said to Gandhi, tell my boy not to eat sugar. And Gandhi said, I can't tell him not to eat sugar. He said, no, tell my boy not to eat sugar. I can't tell him not to eat sugar. He said, bring your boy back in 30 days. Well, the lady revered Gandhi to the point where she didn't question it. She just went away, and in 30 days, she come back. And she said to Gan, tell my boy not to eat sugar. And Gandhi looked at the little boy, and he said, don't eat sugar. And she said, why couldn't you have done that 30 days ago? He said, 30 days ago, I was eating sugar. Pretty good point, isn't it? You got to walk the walk if you're going to talk the talk. You can't just talk about it. You've got to do it. I want to thank Larry Prophet for that story. It was a great story. Well, just like that's a great story, there's some great suggestions here. I've adopted these many years ago. You know, the world has always cried for men and women who can get things done, for people who are self-starters, who see a task through to its finished. And you know, it isn't how much you know, but what you get done that the world rewards and remembers. More people are held back from success because they don't know how to get things done than for any other single reason. Now, this piece of the success puzzle demands your full attention. Because in this spiritual transition that we are involved in, we're going to find things change dramatically. Nepotism, favoritism in the workplace, it ain't going to work anymore. You're not going to get paid for what you know. Now you're getting paid for what you do. And if you can't do it, you don't get it. Now, you see, the biggest handicap to success is not a lack of brains nor character or willingness. It's in their inability to get things done. I remember Earl talking about the largest brain on record belonging to an idiot. And he said the smallest brain on record belonged to Anatole France, who won a Nobel Prize for Literature in 1921. And you see, there's a large group of people. They know what to do, and they almost do it on time. They almost win promotions. They almost become leaders. They're forever looking for one or two pieces of their success puzzle. And you know, you often hear people say they're lazy because they're not winning. I don't think they're lazy. They almost are not lazy. Often they're, they're busier than the very effective few, and they putter around uh, unfocused all day long and half the night. Oh, they fail to accomplish very much. They're held back by indecision. There we are, back with that third piece of the puzzle. Decision by a lack of a worthy ideal. No inspiration. Nothing to really move them ahead. Their daily work lacks meaning. Do you see... We're not made for work. Work is made for us. Work is where we get our source of satisfaction, our psychic income in life. And we need that every bit as much as the material income. They wander around aimlessly and they get nowhere because they don't chart a straight course and then stick to it. Now, this is very important. You do not have to work harder. What we want to do is work more effectively. Make sure our actions are progressive. Make sure that all of our activities move us progressively ahead. Every piece of your puzzle must be put in place now. Do you know it's the producers who raise the world's standard of living? It's the producers who win a big share of the world's rewards. The producers are those people who have formed the habit of getting things done, and they will not permit the almost to knock them off track. Now, on page 63, we're giving you a suggestion here that's going to help you complete your puzzle. You're never going to complete your personal success puzzle playing with other people's puzzles. It just will not do it. And you could very well have formed the habit of doing things that other people want you to do, that you really don't want to do. You know they are not activities that will cause you to progressively realize your worthy ideal. Well, then why do you do them? Well, you know, that's probably part of the paradigm. We're programmed. We don't want to offend people. If they want us to do something, we just say yes. We've got to learn that no is a complete statement. Come down to the bottom of the page. 
People who get things done have to learn to say no to others and to themselves. If you were to phone my office in the past week, you would have got a message asking you not to even leave a message. That I was tied up, I was busy, I was focused on the success puzzle. I didn't feel bad leaving that message. I said if it was an emergency, leave it, and I would get it. Now, look carefully on page 63 in the boxed-in part. I'm suggesting here that you review your day's activities and list the things that you did that other people wanted you to do which would not qualify as progressive action activities. In this space, adjutant to these listed activities, state your reason for doing them. Now, in one of the mentor study seminars that we do, the teleseminars, I use this exercise because it's so important. We spend a lot of time doing things that are non-productive to please non-productive people so that they will be pleased with us. We have been raised to worries about what the neighbors think. Well, I found out what the neighbors think. They don't. So write down, go back over any day, put down all the things that you did that somebody else wanted you to do. They were non-productive. And then ask yourself, why did you do them? You probably won't know why. It was probably a habit. Now, over on page 64, and I'd suggest, by the way, that when you do become aware of those things, you start to change them. And you may find that there's one or two people that you're forever trying to please. You might forget that. On page 64, you're going to find constructive tips for everyday planning. Here we're talking about carrying a small notepad for jotting down things to be done. An inexpensive notepad has contributed a major role in the success of many executives. I am uh, very subjective to uh, extremely successful people. I am also very selective about who I mix with. And it's not that I think I'm any better than anybody else because I know I'm not. I just don't want to mix with people that are going nowhere. And I can remember at the same breakfast meeting, when Earl told me he just managed activities, he took an eight and a half and a by 11 sheet that had been folded twice. So it was about the size of an envelope. There were actually about three sheets all in one. And he kept that in his pocket. He says, as things come to me that have to be done, I jot down on here. Do you know, I have carried that paper with me ever since. I never go anywhere that I don't have those sheets because ideas fly into my mind. I want to write them down. On the number two here, we say plan your day tightly. Schedule progressive action activities. Number three, schedule your outgoing telephone calls so that they can be taken care of in one sitting. There is less chance of finding busy lines early in the morning or late in the afternoon. I learned another thing from Earl Nightingale. I had a goal of working with him, and I wanted to work with him because I wanted to watch him. And I set a goal of having a particular position as vice president of sales so I'd have an office near his and I could watch him. And, of course, that was the goal. That's what happened. That's where I got. And I started to watch him. And the guy, he did more in a short period of time. And it dawned on me one day when I was watching him. You could go into his office. His door was open. You could walk in any time. But you walked in, you stayed in the business you're there for, and you left. Nobody wasted his time. And I came to the conclusion, if you don't waste your time, other people won't waste your time. If you have a tendency to waste your time, other people probably will too. Here we're suggesting that you plan meetings for the beginning or the close of the day, not in the midst of work periods. Write out a list of things to discuss at each meeting so you can keep the meeting on track and not waste time. Plan things that you can think or work at while you're in transit or waiting around. Have material to read or other constructive work handy for odd moments that inevitably crop up. I'll give you a, a suggestion. I carry a small calculator with me, and I'm forever taking and breaking numbers down. I reduce things to the ridiculous. Do you know if you say, I want to earn a million, you can break that into small parts. It doesn't even look very big. Well, get in the habit. I've seen me play with the calculator all the way from uh, America to uh, Malaysia, 25 hours in the air, and not stop playing with it. Number six, the best way to stop wasting your time is to plan your time. Plan tomorrow to tonight. Don't wait for tomorrow morning. When you get out of bed, you can get out running. You know exactly where you're going. Now, virtually everyone in number seven goes to bed at a different time each night. But as a rule, it gets up at the same time every morning. Set an alarm back one hour, and you're going to gain nine 40-hour weeks in a period of a year. 
Well, think of that. Nine 40-hour weeks. That may be what you want to do with this, because I'm going to recommend in a moment that you set aside time just for studying and putting your success puzzle together. Now, look what Sir Walter Raleigh said. He built a great tobacco empire, and he was asked how he accomplished so much in such a short time. Raleigh replied, when there's anything to do, I start it. Don't look at a thing, start it. Don't imagine that it's too difficult, start it. Don't put it off for a day, start it. Don't look for someone else to do it, start it. Don't pretend that you must think it over, start it. Don't start half-heartedly. Put everything you can muster into your start. It can't be done, but with a forceful start, you can do it. Now, you've probably done things throughout your life without using this extra force at the start. Start thinking of how much more you could achieve by making an enthusiastic start at each task every morning. Now, on page 65, we say many of the world's greatest producers have had excuses for not getting things done, but they've ignored the excuses and they've produced. They've not had that easy chair state of mind. They have had ailments galore, but they have been spared that combination which is fatal to producing. Dropsy and heart trouble, a dropping into an armchair and then not having the heart to get out of it. They have produced regardless because they are professionals, and a pro is at his best regardless. I remember one time being in a meeting at the O'Hare Hyatt, and Bill Gove was addressing the audience. In my opinion, that Bill Gove is one of the greatest public speakers who ever walked onto a platform. And he said those lines, and it's stuck in my brain. A pro is at their best regardless. Don't let anything knock you off track. They produce because they are professionals. Now, get up early and follow Raleigh's advice. And we're saying work for satisfaction. Do not be distracted by the know-it-all who's behind their installment payments. A person who is doing his best today is truly alive. Go back and read about Goethe. Read the excerpt from his letter. Goethe was truly alive. A person who did his best yesterday is stagnant. Here's the common phrase, I can make enough money as it is. That's the alibi of those who imagine that people should work for money instead of for satisfaction. Work for satisfaction. Get the psychic income that your heart and your mind crave for. This is the end of Side 11. Side 12 is already queued up for your listening. We have arrived at the last part of the puzzle, but it's certainly an important part. We can get so inspired and enthused with all this good information, it's absolutely essential that we follow through. You have a heading commitments, and then you have daily commitment. I am going to suggest, and I truly wish you would accept this and act on it. I want to recommend that you take a specific time every day Early in the morning is probably the best. And you set aside an hour, take what's on page 68 and 69, and go through the ritual, follow these exercises, and do it every day. Now turn to the top of page 68. The exercises that are recommended here will virtually guarantee the successful completion of your puzzle, and it'll keep you progressively realizing your worthy ideal until, as Thoreau said, You'll realize that it has manifested and it'll be unexpected in common hours. One day you're just going to wake up and realize it's happened. It is, however, absolutely essential that you make a binding commitment to follow the strategy that's outlined daily until you've altered your paradigm and created the habits that will automatically carry you forward. These paradigms have got a real grip on us. Paradigms don't let go easy. There's only two ways of altering them constant spaced repetition, and an emotional impact. Very few people are changed through impact. Most are changed through repetition. This is the suggestion. This is the strategy. The following quote by Goethe has never been used more appropriately than it is here and now. I want you to think about your puzzle. 
I want you to think about your worthy ideal. Do you really want to have it manifest? Do you want to see it progressively manifest? Do you want to progressively realize it? Well, he said, if you do, he said, are you in earnest? Then seize this very minute what you can do or even dream you can do and begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Only engage and the mind will grow heated. Begin and the work will be completed. Now, before going any further, I want you to act on faith. I'm going to ask you to read this commitment aloud, my binding commitment. I will complete the exercises outlined here every day for 90 days. I will allocate a special time each day and discipline myself to use that same time daily for these new exercises. Now, I'm going to ask you to sign it, and I'm going to ask you to put the date on it. Now, if you really want to be wise, photocopy it, go and give a copy of this to someone that you really respect and tell them that you're committed to do this and ask them if they even see you wavering. They'll hold up the commitment sheet and that'll get you moving. Now, you're going to review parts of each lesson on what is success, the first part of the puzzle. Review and rewrite on page eight the four words, progressive, realization, worthy, and ideal. Write out what they mean to you. Every day you sit down and you write those words out. What do they mean to you today? The second part in the success, reread and seriously consider page 11, outlining the three parts of your personality, conscious mind, subconscious mind, and body. Read it until you get so used to seeing yourself as the stick person or seeing the stick person as you. Build the concept in your mind. Be acutely aware of how your mind's working. You will know then, if you're talking to somebody and you start to feel bad, that you're accepting a negative suggestion from them. Just kick it back out. You've got to see this. As you read it over and over and over again, it starts to take a grip. I'm so consciously aware of my mind and what I'm doing with it, but it's the repetition of this. Now come down to the third bullet point under what is success on page 68. Review success, mind, and attitude on page 12 until the concept is firmly planted in your subconscious mind. See, on page 11, we get how the three parts work. On page 12, we start focusing on how we're working with it. Now turn over onto page 69. When you review a worthy ideal, review page 21 covering your intellectual factors and get in the habit of asking yourself if you're aware that you're exercising these mental muscles. Want to build your memory? Go get Harry Lorraine Jerry Lucas's book on memory. Read the book. Take a section of it and start to use it. It's broken into different sections. Take the part on names, start to use it, and you're going to find it'll work for you. But take those intellectual factors and start looking at them and paying attention to them and say, that's where my mental strength is. No wonder where the ideal, the second bullet point, memorize the quote by Troward from the Dory Lectures. My mind is a center of divine operation. Memorize that entire quote. The third bullet point, crystallize and rewrite your worthy ideal on page 25. Rewrite your worthy ideal every day. Just keep rewriting it, rewriting it, rewriting it. It has to happen. Now on page 69, the third puzzle piece, decision. Memorize the four-point process for making decisions on page 31 and form the habit of using them. Do I want to have, do, or be whatever it is? Do I want it? Well, moving this or well, doing this move me in the direction of my dream. Will doing this violate any of God's laws? Is it in harmony with God's laws? Will it violate the rights of others? You're looking for three yeses and a no. The second bullet point under decision. Use the $3 million exercise on page 32 to meet a present challenge. Get in the habit of sharing that exercise with people because it's so good. The next point on decision, read Carol Hildebrand's essay on decision on page 33 daily. 
Read it over and over and over again, and you're going to start to realize what decision really means. Because we do state preferences. We don't always make decisions. And her article, I've read that, I'll bet, 150 times. It is so good. Now, your last bullet point on decision. Review the three exercises, knowledge, thought, and awareness for making decisions on page 34. Now, the whole essence there on that page is that everything we want is here. We've got to make the decision or we're never going to attract even the thoughts or the things that'll get us there. We go as far as we can see. When we get there, we realize that our conditions, our circumstance and environment have changed. We adapt to the change and then we see how we can go further. Always moving up in consciousness. Now you come to the fourth piece of the puzzle, paradigms. Review the praxis exercise on page 43 and check your progress. Every time you catch yourself saying, well, I believe that, say, do I do it? Have I integrated my beliefs with my behavior? That exercise in itself could be worth millions of dollars to you. The second bullet point, review your objective attitude gauge exercise on page 46. Get used to looking at what you're doing and what you want. And you want to get the doing part of the present results moved over with what you want closer and closer until they jive. Now, come down on page 69 to infinite supply. I love this lesson. Reread aloud the memorandum from Troward on page 52. Gosh, you could read that for the next 10 years and keep getting something out of it. Review the creative visuals. Headed 1, 3, 2 on page 54. Realize that everything's hooked up. The non-physical and the physical, it's all hooked together. Just like the colors of a rainbow. The last bullet point under infinite supply, rewrite your gratitude statement on page 56 daily. You remain grateful, and I guarantee you, you'll continually be rewarded. And now down to our progressive action activities. Review and check your progress for completing your own puzzle on page 63. And from the constructive tips on page 64, read Sir Walter Raleigh's advice aloud every day. I want to close with this poem on wishing. It said, do you wish the world were better? Let me tell you what to do. Set a watch upon your actions and always keep them straight and true. Rid your mind of selfish motives. Let your thoughts be clean and high. You can make a little Eden of the sphere you occupy. Do you wish the world were wiser? Well, suppose you make a start by accumulating wisdom in the scrapbook of your heart. Do not waste one page on folly. Live to learn and learn to live. If you want to give men knowledge, you must get it ere you give. Do you wish the world were happy? Then remember day by day just to scatter seeds of kindness as you pass along the way. For the pleasure of the many may be oft times traced to one as the hand. This is the end of side 12. Please fast forward the tape to the end to queue up side 11 for your next listening.